Welcome to The Reason Roundtable, the flagship uh, podcast from the magazine that will not inflict revenge on its political enemies, at least not just yet. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Nice to see you all again. Howdy. Hey, Matt. Happy Monday. Uh, it was great to see several thousand of our listeners, okay, maybe not quite that many, yeah. uh, out uh, in uh, Washington, uh, D.C. on Thursday for a special live uh, uh, podcast. And uh, we'll be uh, producing the results of those experiments uh, sometime later this week, I presume. Uh, but it was really fun. Does anyone want to have any reflections, want to share any uh, any live energy moments? I just love seeing people out there and I love being in a weird movie theater that kind of should be a parking garage in the middle of Washington, D.C. It's the It was at the E Street Landmark Cinema, sort of an art, underground art house theater that I have been to many, many, many times over the course of my years at watching and reviewing movies in Washington. And it was uh, it was great fun to finally be part of the show and to see all of all of you listeners who came out and applauded us and laughed at our terrible jokes and booed at mine i that's not inaccurate uh all right let's jump into the uh news last week uh president joseph robinette uh, biden the second in his 41st month in office uh signed an executive order banning migrants from applying for asylum status unless they get in line at an official border point of entry by which he means use the government's uh, smartphone asylum app three mm. weeks ahead of time, not while they're in their native country, but somewhere uh, semi-close. That usually means Mexico, which is a super not necessarily great country uh, at the moment. Um, at the border, they had better be one of just 1,450 asylum applicants that day or else they are out of luck. Uh, for context, the average number of daily uh, asylum applicants is well north of 2,000. Uh, there's also a processing backlog of more than 2 million uh, applicants, and the executive order does nothing to speed up that process at all. It is also contrary to the plain language of the 1980 Refugee Act, which provides that any non-citizen who arrives in the United States, quote, whether or not at a designated port of arrival and irrespective of their status, may apply for asylum. And, quote, courts have ruled on several occasions, including against Joe Biden last year and Donald Trump a couple of times, uh, that presidents who otherwise have significant latitude on immigration policies cannot use their presidential magic wands to make the Refugee Act go away. Uh, Catherine, in this space last week, you previewed this as a bit of news that was uh, a little bit under the radar in the wake of Donald Trump's conviction. Now that we've seen the actual test of the executive order, text, I said, right, text, uh, the executive order, um, uh, what are your thoughts about what it does and does not do? Yeah, I think it's still being undercovered for clearly partisan reasons. Obviously, people have been talking about it, but um, it's creating a huge amount of kind of cognitive dissonance and um, internal tension among Biden supporters who supported him because he was going to be more liberal on immigration. That was a real voting block. That is the reason that millions and millions of people donated to the ACLU during the Trump era because they felt that Trump's immigration policies were inhumane. Uh, this Biden policy is not substantially different. It is different in the details. It is different in some of the implementation, but it is fundamentally still a much more restrictive policy aimed specifically at people who are seeking asylum. So again, this is people who are coming here saying that they are in danger at home, essentially. Um, and it sucks. It sucks that we are going to this is uh, has long been a partisan issue, but that we are having a final pivot here at the end of Biden's first term to uh, make sure that everyone has thoroughly betrayed their stated principles before the election. Nick, I'm struck by the uh, year 1980 in all of this, which is to say yeah. that this act, which courts keep saying, hey, look, you passed this. Uh, you can't really do things that are in direct contravention, um, came at a time when we had a worldwide refugee crisis. And it was also a transition year between Jimmy Carter, the apparently indestructible Jimmy, Jimmy Carter, and Ronald Reagan, both of yeah. whom uh, understood America to be having the lead role in trying to figure out what to do 
with the world's uh, wretched, uh, poor uh, refugees. And, right. um, you know, we're in the middle of, of a historic Western Hemisphere creation of refugees, particularly from Venezuela. The numbers are staggering, like 8 million mm -hmm. people. Uh, reflect on that a little bit. How does that, uh, wh where, where do you think we are as a country in understanding or even uh, like thinking about America's role as a refugee application center? I think that uh, first and foremost, you need to understand Biden's action is purely politics. And we have reverted back to the great American tradition of scapegoating immigrants when we're unhappy with how things seem to be going in our daily lives. Um, people don't really make a big distinction between people who are refugees and asylees and then people who are coming here to live a better life. Um, and when things start to get dicey, uh, immigrants, uh, particularly when they're pouring over a southern border, which is incredibly poorly managed, uh, you know, this this is the way things go uh, and have always gone in American history. Um, so in that sense, we've reverted back to a kind of standard American trope that immigrants are coming here to steal American prosperity exactly at the moment when it is disappearing from all of us. So kudos, Joe Biden. You've never been more American in telling people who are desperate to come here to escape poverty and political uh, problems, you know, that they're not welcome. Uh, so you have that. To go back to 1980, uh, Matt, you never uh, cease to uh, remind us of this, which I think is really important. The greatest thing in the 1980, you know, kind of Reagan campaign is the primary debate between uh, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, where they had a debate about immigration in Houston. Uh, before either had clinched the nomination. Um, and what they do is they are arguing and outbidding each other on what they will do to make illegal immigrants more acceptable in America, to give them legal status, to give them more access to the American dream, because they each agree and literally say something almost exactly like this, that we know that illegal immigrants are a major part of the fabric of America and we should be welcome, welcoming them into our world where they can live and work peacefully and profitably and add to general prosperity. Uh, we are so far from that world where the Republican Party now, there is not a single major Republican who will openly say, I am in favor of more legal immigration. Uh, you know, and it's easy. You can just say, we need to secure the border. There's something wrong when, you know, when our border checkpoints are not working anymore. Uh, but I am in favor of more legal immigration. Increasingly, there are no uh, national Democrats who will say we need to fix the legal immigration system and make it easier for more people to come here regardless of circumstance and we need to secure the border. So I think going back to 1980 is a good place to start because fundamentally we need to get back to a place where we recognize that immigration is not going away. Immigration is not primarily a function of America. It's a function of how fucked up the rest of the world is. And we've spent a lot of time fucking up the rest of the world. Um, we need to uh, get to a place where we, uh, you know, where we play the historic role that we've had, uh, which even if we're scapegoating immigrants, we're actually allowing more and more of them to come in here and to help us become, uh, you know, the, the country that we've always been. Peter, um, one of the snap polls taken uh, since this action has it polling at around 70 percent of public ap approval. I cannot think of the last time Joe Biden did anything. Um, that polled at around 70%. What do you say to the people who point at that and say, scoreboard, it worked? Well, if if it worked is, uh, you can say it worked if your goal, if worked, the definition of worked is uh, it was politically popular a couple of days later. But it worked <laughs> is not the same as, uh, like that's not the same, or it, it was politically popular a couple of days later is not the same as saying, well, look, the border situation is in fact under control here. And Biden knows this. This is completely and purely a political play in an election year, and that's all that this is. And so, you know, uh, as Catherine mentioned, this was done on the basis of the same law that Trump used to impose his Muslim ban, which Biden, of course, was against. And I went back and I looked at the remarks that Biden gave uh, 
eight years after uh, but, uh, the, the Trump immigration ban was first proposed. And I just want to read them to you. And I'll admit, I'm going to very slightly edit them, but only very slightly. So on this day, eight years ago, candidate for president Donald Trump proposed his Muslim travel ban. Like millions of Americans, I was appalled. The proposal was a cynical ploy. It was about sowing fear and distrust, not about protecting national security. And it betrayed America's long history of welcoming people. Like, that's, that's this. That's this again. He's using the same law to do the same thing. Not okay. Not exactly the same thing, but but he's using the same law to do a similar thing for similar political reasons. And if it is popular uh, one week later, that doesn't mean that anything is fixed. That doesn't mean that this is going to work. That doesn't mean that it's a good idea. Hey, Matt. Uh, yeah. Can I read you a quote from Nick Kristoff? Oh yeah. Thanks. Yeah yeah. I know. I know you Oof. love that. Always. Um, yeah. Here here's his column uh, today. <clears throat> Are we, the people of an immigrant nation, pulling up the ladder after we have boarded? Yes, to some degree. But the reality is that we can't <laughs> absorb everyone who wants in, and it's better that the ladder be raised in an orderly way by reasonable people. Yeah. I, is that a metaphor question? Because I totally get it. That's yeah, fine. the metaphor is fine. The lad It's all the same ladder in the metaphor, so the metaphor yeah. is not mixed. Um, but the sentiment is atrocious. Uh, the idea that it's he he's just saying out loud it's okay if our guy does it it's bad if your guy does it uh this is like all over the place right now it's just like democrats and moderates who you know have felt that our policy toward immigrants is you know in some way lacking and inhumane uh have just like turned on a dime because what matters is who wins the election i think the poll that shows um people currently support the biden policy should be contextualized uh, with the polls that showed uh, all time highs for support for both uh, immigration and free trade during the Trump administration. No. Um, maybe just maybe those polls are not really about the underlying policy issues. Um, it is interesting. Uh, uh, in 1995, uh, Gallup has been asking, is immigration generally a good thing or a bad thing for a long time? Uh, the recent high, and I don't know if 1995 counts as recent, it's increasingly, it seems just like yesterday to me, but... Um, 65% of uh, Americans wanted the, uh, the amount of immigration decreased uh, to the country. And, and Matt, uh, I know you've written a lot about this. That was a big part of Bill Clinton's reelection campaign. He spent more time jawboning about uh, not just uh, stopping illegal immigration, but deporting existing illegal immigrants in America back to their home countries and got standing uh, ovations for that kind of thing. Uh, we're now at 41% of Americans, according to Gallup, wanting to decrease the level of legal immigration, which is since then basically the high so there is a widespread perception that immigration is somehow adding to the chaos of the country i think we all agree i mean i know we all agree that that's that's you know bad consciousness on the part of americans and things like that but it is a political reality and biden is bowing to it and you know Catherine, that uh, that Christoph column, when I read that, I was just like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. But Except for like, this... he can't shock us now, can he, Nick? Yeah, no. And it's like, go back and pretend to be from Oregon and live there, you know, and run for governor <laughs> again or run for dog catcher of governor. But these are people, you know, this is like the way that people like Maureen Dowd shitted themselves in order to protect Clinton from charges of sexual harassment or sexual assault. It's like... You know, this this is why people hate boomers, right? Because boomers in particular who fucking fly around, you know, on some kind of moral badge of certitude and superiority. The minute that somebody like Joe Biden is threatened, like, oh, the great Joe Biden's not going to get reelected. So I'm going to chuck at everything I actually believe and say the dumbest fucking things possible. It's like, goodbye, Nick Kristoff. And, and the people you represent, like you need to leave at this point. Deport really them, not, you know, not somebody coming here willing to work at Jimmy John's for $20 an hour. I really, really love Nick's like morning two minutes of self-hate. Like I'm, I'm really yes. here for it. Uh, uh, my, uh, also, my, go ahead. Just the incentives in the, in the details of this, I think are really bad. I, I wanna go ahead and make a prediction, which is that because of the way this, uh, this executive order has been written, uh, we are going to see actually more unaccompanied children, and we are going to see a dramatic spike in the numbers of 
people who are claiming to have been trafficked. And that's because those are two loopholes that are written into those uh, into the ceilings for people who can apply um, at the uh, as um, asylum seekers. So uh, unaccompanied immigrant children, victims of human trafficking, people who have visas or those facing serious medical emergencies uh, are not a part of these new rules, which means unless you're an idiot, you're going to show up right. and say, I was human trafficked. <clears throat> and that's going to get you to jump the line. And I just want us to keep that in mind when later, um, you know, Liz Nolan Brown has to debunk all those statistics. Catherine, Wasn't there just... a story not very long ago about immigrants uh, paying people to I don't know, rob, like hold up or rob yeah. uh, them or something, right? Because that created that expedited the 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 process somehow or another. If you're um, a victim of a crime, then you get a different status, right. which is why those so, people that got like fraudulently bussed to New York or Martha's Vineyard or whatever all ended up yeah. getting to stay. And so, you know, if you're skeptical that these sorts of incentives actually change people's behavior, just look at that where people were actually staging holdups. And in at least one case, as I recall, there was a gun that was fired and somebody was uh, was hurt or maybe even killed. Um, right. As one of these as, as part of the process of this. And these these incentives do shape how people uh, behave because people are desperate to come here. And so if you're going to put uh, if you're going to put loopholes in there where you say, well, there's exceptions for people who are trafficked, there's exceptions for people with serious medical emergencies, if there's exceptions for unaccompanied minors, then you're going to see more of them, at least at the margins. A couple of quick notes. I, I, I swear to God, Catherine just put a loophole in the ceiling. So I'm calling the metaphor police on her. Uh, at <laughs> <Yeah. two laughs> That's the... fine. You know what? I'm in favor of metaphor rule of law. It's it's a if you if I violated it, I, too, must be held accountable. Um, so but... if you if you don't uh, if you don't follow the law, then they're going to hang you by your loophole. I hate you to uh, uh, from Nick... the ceiling. <laughs> my, my God, uh, Keep two going is back. that you can do it. the worst uh, or my favorite like anti boomer moment that still hasn't been topped, I think, was during the second Clinton administration. Back then, I forget right, who was doing this, the Drug Enforcement Administration probably, but they had a campaign um, saying, uh, just because you survived drugs doesn't mean, or marijuana, doesn't mean that your kids will. <laughs> like, yeah. You absolute douchebags, every single one of you. Uh, and three, just because there's a rule of three, I forget what that's for. But if you look at the history of immigration policy, and I had a, a, some posts, I think in 2016, that uh, mirrored the the or talked about the mirroring of the major parties' platforms about immigration. They kind of went hand in hand. In 1996, the platforms for both the Democratic Party yeah. and uh, the Republican Party sounded like uh, very Trumpian in their nature. Um, a lot of just like you know we, we can't allow these illegals and etc. Um, and then they started to diverge only I think really with the rise of Trump uh, when he uh, escalated into our lives, talking about uh, Mexico not sending our best uh, and so forth. And then in by 2016, there's a divergence in rhetoric from the Democrats. It'll be very interesting to see to the extent that platforms yep. matter at all um, what the stated uh, uh, policy preferences of the Democratic Party will be in their platform process in 2024. Nick, I hear you wanting to say something. Uh, the you know the the larger question here from a policy perspective too is like what are we doing to increase legal immigration? And if you look at the you know the relevant numbers, we are not increasing the vastly, if at all, the number of people who can get green cards who can come live and work here legally. Um, a lot of other uh, visas, temporary visas or special visas and things like that also have not been increased. And it's, you know, it, it's it's kind of an iron law of reality that co uh, countries don't really control borders to certain degrees they can. And if you want to be totalitarian or authoritarian about it, you can. But in general, ebbs and flows of people moving to different places is dictated by large forces that have a lot to do with problems over there and prosperity here and things like, and the relative merits of that. What we can do if we want relatively orderly uh, migration patterns, which is good for everybody, it's good for our culture, it's good for our economy, it's good for our politics, 
you have to make it legal for people to be able to move and show up and pay taxes. Um, and we're just not doing that because everybody's now focused on the footage footage around the border. That's not where the issue is. Like that's never going to be solved anytime soon, particularly with situations like the one you have in Venezuela, which is an ongoing, you know, destruction of a country over decades now. People aren't going to stop leaving Venezuela and coming to America anytime soon. What we can do is process them in their home countries. Uh, you know, you can you can apply and get TSA pre in a fucking Staples in America. We can process people in their home countries and vet them before they come over here. Right. And then the other thing I'll say, and this was a real uh, guaranteed applause getter at the uh, free press uh, fire debate on immigration I participated in a couple months ago in Dallas. You know, we can build a wall around the welfare state, not the United States. That's the thing. Let's do that. Let's make things more legal and more open, make it easier to identify who's coming here, give them the proper papers, put them in the system. And ev literally everybody wins. You know, the only people who lose are people from, you know, people like Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela. Uh, and I think we can all we can sleep easy at, you know, knowing that authoritarians and tyrants are losing productive, forward looking citizens. What I'm hearing here is too many Nicks. Um, and uh, I think we can all get behind that. A, That's a lot of Nicks. I agree. Bef before we uh, pivot to video uh, is that President Biden is doing this knowing, knowing that this will likely be struck down by the courts. And this is not the first time that he has done that. Yeah. My message to our friends who are going to vote against Donald Trump because he's an affront to the rule of law is reflect on that. Um, all right, speaking of uh, a rule of law and Donald Trump and all that uh, bit, there's been a lot of talk, maybe, maybe too much talk about imprisoning political opponents. What with Trump's conviction, uh, he met with a parole officer just today. Uh, by the way, uh, in advance of his uh, sentencing, uh, the Hunter Biden gun trial um, and uh, uh, various scare stories, usually involving uh, some kind of scary Steve Bannon quote along the lines of we must seize the day, um, all about warning that Trump's second term will be a festival of judicial lock em up revenge. Uh, fun fact about Steve Bannon, a uh, judge last week ordered him to go to prison for four months. Uh, for uh, refusing to obey a criminal subpoena or a, a congressional uh, subpoena. Sorry, um, Catherine. So it's a subpoena by criminals that yes, that's live what I, in Congress, right? You you understand the workings of my brain better yeah. than I do. Um, Catherine, uh, you're soft on victimless crime. I'm looking around at all of these things, uh, like including the Trump case, uh, the civil case in Manhattan where he paid like a billion dollars because he overstated his wealth in a bank loan application. Um, I'm having a hard time seeing any victim that isn't the government. Um, should we do an immediate shutdown of all these political world trials until we can figure out what's going on? Well, I mean, I wouldn't say that all of these political world trials uh, collectively have no victims, uh, but I do think the, the two particular yeah, There's four cases, victims right here on this podcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for, for first of all, like who will make restitution to us, I ask you. Um, but, you know, I do think that there's... Um, uh, there is this problem, right, which is that none of these are uh, shooting a guy on Fifth Avenue, right? Like none of these are sort of things that are recognizable to an ordinary citizen as a kind of Ten Commandments style crime um, that should sort of have clear and swift justice. And so as a result, the justice has been neither clear nor swift in any of these cases. Um, Bannon has been supposed to go to prison since 2022, uh, those four months have been hanging out for a long time. Um, and not and even for his double shirting. Not even for the double shirting. And lest we forget, not for the <laughs> crime of uh, defrauding people around the funding of the border God, wall for which Trump pardoned him, uh, right? Like he got there's a whole, victims there. He yeah. got a whole ass pardon for a crime with real victims. Yeah. And uh, and the by the way, his cronies did not like this is a thing that I had forgotten. But uh, the other people who were in on that scheme with him have to pay millions in restitution and forfeiture. They are serving years in prison in case you wanted to tell a story about how Trump, you know, had an underlying case that that crime was not a crime. No, he just 
only pardoned his buddy, Bannon. So to be honest, you know, I never want to say, oh, well, you got charged with a bunch of things and you only got hit with the little one. That's fine. Um, that's something that Reason has written about how that is bad. You should not stack charges in that way. But um, going to prison for four months does not actually seem like it is disproportionate to Bannon's crimes overall. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think that that there is that there is. One reason we are in this mess is because everyone wants to lock everyone up for things that are not on their face, obviously crimes with obvious victims. That is not to say that crimes were not committed. You mean like the double shirting when Bannon's just collaring himself? Y'all are obsessed. Oh, oh my God. I should have seen that coming. Peter, in addition to telling the worst dad jokes and puns yeah. on the planet. Is it getting planet, worse? It feels like it's worse. getting You're worse. like the Genghis Khan of dad jokes. <laughs> Uh, and so I like I spawned like half the exactly. planet. Like the, you seem to tell like forty percent of all dad jokes. Every Y chromosome yeah. somehow they, contains a dad genomically joke. Genomically sequence the them. They're gonna find out that it's all Suderman dad joke. All right, what's the question, Matt? Uh, I, I will note that you live in uh, Washington uh, D.C. Uh, do Sometimes, you get, do you get any vibes from someone who is not <clears throat> either libertarian or libertarian adjacent? That hey, kind of this. This is a bad trend on both sides, and maybe we should knock it off. I so that's a good question. Do I get any vibes? I think what I uh, what I see is that sober and responsible minded people on the right are aware that this is a bad trend, and maybe a little bit uh, on the left, but it's mostly the. Trump skeptical intellectuals on the right are aware that this is a this is a bad dynamic. And that's maybe not all of them, right? And when I say Trump skeptical, I don't mean the the hardcore anti-Trump folks on the right, the 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 you know, who many of whom think, well, you know what? He's a bad guy. I'm fine with him going to prison if he actually did the did some crimes, even if those crimes are, you know, kind of nonsensy, as we discussed the other week. Um no, I I, I don't see any real any real reckoning with the uh, backlash that th- this is that that is going to happen here or that is likely to happen? What people are saying is, well, you know, this is just Trump. Um, when Trump is threatening, when he's when he's saying, "Oh, you know, it's a terrible, terrible path they're leading us to," and it's very possible that it's going to happen to them. And what he means is basically, if I am president, maybe we will start doing prosecutions against my political enemies, and we will we will gear up for that. Uh, what I see is when people see that in Washington. What they think is, well, that's just Trump being bad. That's just Donald Trump uh, threatening to abuse his power. And it is. It is Trump being bad and threatening to abuse his power and abuse the office. But there was a precedent here and there is a Hatfields and McCoys situation that needs to stop at some point or another. And there doesn't seem to be any real mechanism for doing that. Nick, um, how can we, uh, the libertarians, the 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 good Nicks, if you will, of the world, more um, necks, more necks. Uh, uh, just fewer, Nick, but Nick, Nick, yeah. fewer, Nick, but Nick, Nick, better. Spot necks, yeah. Um, how can we help the rest of our less libertarian uh, brethren and sistren, sestren, yeah. uh, tur- turn out of this skid? I, I I don't know, but at some point when you guys were talking about the uh, uh, Bannon's wall scam, which does seem like you should go to jail for that, but if they did build any of the wall and we built some of the wall, I was thinking maybe it would be good to hang the AIDS quilt from the border wall. And that would kind of make people think twice, like, do you really want to come to America? I assume I that this is Nick's way of answering your skid metaphor because you're supposed to steer into the skid. And that, that's oh, what that feels like. Yeah, that's like. right. Yeah. That's the problem. I don't know, he, Matt. Yeah, he definitely I, steered out of the skid. That's yeah, I don't know. I, I have very mark. little to add to that, although I will say that Hunter Biden... Um, you know, if you're lying on an application for a gun, you know, a gun ownership, you know, that should be taken seriously. I don't think it necessarily means you go to jail. Well, if we have the laws, Matt Welch, this is Bill James 101. If you have laws in place, if you have rules in place and you don't enforce them, bad things happen. So either get rid of the rules, get rid of the rules or enforce them. But... You so know, you want everyone to be enforced of three felonies a day? Uh, no. What I'm saying is that if you, you know, are you are you just going to let's get rid of uh, federal gun registration then or federal right. gun uh, ownership so, applications? Twist but, my arm. 
Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. don't threaten us with a good time. Okay. I mean, it really does seem like people have, like, fully blacked out on the, like, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And they are just all you, in on do unto others as they did unto you. Like, do you every think, I mean, do you think people should uh, really get in explicitly. trouble for not paying taxes? Uh, I think that you, trouble. We can leave it unspecified. I but, say trouble. I, I don't. I don't think jail yeah. time. Okay. Uh, I. I. I don't Which, think how that, should should Biden should there Hunter should be a Biden victim who be... is not the government? If you're going to go to jail, there should be a victim who is not the okay. government. Okay. That's. I, I, I probably point. agree with that. All of these are like they. Many of these crimes, these sort of crimes for which people are going after their political opponents, fall into this category of well, it's not enforce the law or don't enforce the law. It's if the law is regularly not enforced and mm -hmm. then you wake up one day and enforce it against your opponents, how do we think about that? And I that's mean, what's happening in almost all of this. I, I don't necessarily see a large pattern there with the uh, with the Trump prosecution in New York. I think we see a clear cut case of politicizing laws, uh, charges against somebody who is actively running for president. And that is a category difference in terms of, you know, the potential, like if that becomes a regular thing where you take, you try to take out, you know, viable candidates for office using whatever you can find rummaging around, that is the beginning of the end of, of you know, some aspect of the American experiment. This other stuff, you know, I'm not in favor of most of it. It does strike me that the Steve Bannon stuff, like that was a scam you know, where he built people out of money saying, hey, I'm going to use this money to do this, and then I'm not. Um, and that seems like it might be worthy of jail time. But sure. in but general, I'm not too worried one. about this stuff. Defying a congressional subpoena. I mean, he got subpoena. pardoned for that one. It was a totally different, right. It was the subpoena thing, which people do to varying degrees all the no, time. No, no, but there is the, the thing about uh, the, you know, it, uh, his Confederates in, you know, raising money to build the wall. Yeah, of course. And then yes. not doing that. Yeah. yeah, that's that's there's but victims. I also think with the Hunter Biden stuff, I mean, uh, Jacob Solem, who is writing an entire book about the subject of the overlap between the war on uh, drugs and the war on guns. Um, he's written about how this is a somewhat unusual confluence of events for Hunter Biden as well. And mm. seems at least plausible that there was additional scrutiny there because of his father. All right. We're going to get to our a listener email here in a week, in a week, in a moment. <laughs> All right. Bye. That's how it feels. Uh, <laughs> uh, but first, a reminder that this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp, which apparently I need. Friends, do you ever feel like yeah. you need to get something off your chest, like long buried resentment towards a coworker uh, or guilt for not having finished an editing assignment? Astonishment that your 15 year old is really badly raised? Well, it's good not to just think about your troubles. Pour yourself a cup of tea, think about the bubbles, but rather to talk about them out loud, maybe even with a licensed professional who can help you convert those stifled secrets into an action plan. That's where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. BetterHelp is an easy to use, super flexible, entirely online therapy service that has helped many listeners of this podcast do some proper ventilation in order to more smoothly get through their day. All you have to do is fill out a quick questionnaire, get matched with a therapist, if you don't like the first one, you can just swap them out for a second. Let therapy help you get it all out. With BetterHelp, just visit BetterHelp.com slash roundtable right now to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder, please email your brief queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Greg M. Who writes, hello, simple question. Which part of the Constitution gives the federal government the authority to operate passenger rail? Thanks. I appreciate the brevity. Catherine, what's the answer to Judge Napolitano's question? Um, <laughs> Napolitano. Always, always fair to ask where in the Constitution uh, the answer here and nearly everywhere is nowhere in the Constitution does it say. Um, there are a couple of Supreme Court cases where Amtrak has tried to have its constitutional cake and eat it, too. I think so far yes. we're safe Whoa, man. Um, because um, they sometimes want to assert that they are basically the government. Um, as, for instance, in the case where they are heavily involved in setting standards for rail. Um, and sometimes they want to say that they are totally a private entity and definitely not the government, as in cases where people want to have the, for the First, Amend First Amendment 
apply to uh, advertising and other speech in the context of Amtrak. Uh, Amtrak just wants to be whatever it is most convenient for Amtrak to be at any given time. Is it part of the government? Is it private? Unclear. The Supreme Court pretty consistently has said it really looks a lot like y'all are the government. It sure looks government-y over there. Um, But is it constitutional? Absolutely not hardly special in that regard. It's like we should it should be like maybe the post office train. We could be constitutional. I don't know. Is there such a thing as the post office train? But Peter, does it? Does oh, that's what to... Amtrak calls themselves when they go to court. They're like, hello, it's Post Office Express. We're here to be yeah. to be constitutional. But does it have to be explicitly uh, can do authorized in the Constitution, Peter, for the government to do it? <sighs> Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, <laughs> clearly, it does not have to be, Matt. Look at the government we have and then look at the Constitution and try to find words that authorize like all this stuff that's happening. So the, the answer is no, it doesn't have to be that way because that's not how the government works. The government just kind of does what it wants to do. And occasionally somebody objects and says, that's not in the Constitution. And then the courts will say, well, it's OK anyway. Or ah, maybe it's not in this case, but most of the time they say, well, it's OK anyway. And that's how we get passenger rail service run by a quasi public corporation that sometimes wants to be the government and sometimes doesn't and maybe should just be the post office. Uh, Nick, interstate commerce for you. Uh, yeah, I mean, all of this stuff is kind of a- an emanation of the uh, of an interpretation of the Commerce Clause that, uh, you know, became ubiquitous during the FDR years. So. Uh, virtually everything that Congress does that is not explicitly specified in the Constitution gets justified through an un- unbelievably expansive uh, reading of the Commerce Clause. Uh, we did, uh, and by we, I mean uh, Austin Bragg did an excellent uh, video about this during the Obamacare years, uh, where um, you know we started having these bizarre conversations at the Supreme Court level of not only could the federal government do certain things to affect interstate commerce, but could it force people to engage in certain types of commerce? And the Commerce Clause, you know, this this expansive reading is just terrible. It's one of the reasons why uh, uh, the federal government ruled against uh, homegrown medical marijuana in California. Uh, you know, and this was people like that great strict constitutional uh, scholar Antonin Scalia was talking about how uh, you know a medical marijuana patient growing weed in her backyard was going to affect interstate commerce by making that weed like she doesn't have to buy it from illegal drug gangs that operate in all the states so you know the, the federal government has a right to regulate something even if it's happening completely only within a state so it's the commerce clause it's bad and in terms of Amtrak I really want to rail against the fact that I took the train back from D.C. to New York and in the cafe car they had a modestly priced cheese plate that was like seven bucks and they were still advertising and I ordered it and the guy was like oh we don't have that anymore and he literally ripped that old poster with the menu down and then sold me a a cheese and fruit plate that was $13 so it's like with a bunch of fruit on it that I didn't want to eat so screw Amtrak. Old man is that, shaking that fist yeah. out of cloud. We really, this Very is the annoying. boomer, the boomer the, sandwich the, right here. The pistachio bag, though, for five dollars and fifty cents is still quite a bargain. Did he yell afuera when he was ripping it down? <laughs> I hope. Ah, no, no, because he's the opposite. He's opposite. the opposite of Malay, it's right? Fuera. Um, yeah. uh, I would just uh, add, uh, not constitutionally, but just for all of our friends out there who just love my trains um, and wish that we could have high read, high read? What the hell? Yeah. Uh, high high, sh- high speed rail. <laughs> high uh, cheese rail, Matt. High <laughs> cheese rail. High cheese rail. <laughs> Matt, get your brain back on track. <laughs> Between Bismarck, wherever Bismarck is, and, uh, you know, uh, the Central Valley of California. Um, yeah. Europe, where everyone loves, all the train weenies love to talk about Europe. Europe is filled with high-speed rail all over the place and just rail rail that's run by private companies. Mm-hmm. That's built sometimes by private companies. It's run by private companies. There's entire subway systems in Scandinavia run by the Red Chinese on a contract basis. Um, they understand that you can have actual uh, private uh, Got a industry. mostly privately built high-speed rail in uh, southern Florida, south uh, 
southern to central Florida as well, Matt. Walsh. We can do it in the states, but we don't yeah. do a lot about of that thinking on a federal level. Spain has private high speed rail all over the place, and it's very popular. The Malagasy um, Republic. Thank you. Are for, we just going to start randomly calling out names of countries now, Matt, with I think, possible high speed rail privately funded projects? I uh, know. Rain in just, Spain falls yeah. mainly on the train. Going to just basically recite cheese <laughs> menus all the way down. Okay. Uh, lightning round time. Here's a story that uh, chattering classes cannot get enough of. And I'm not sure a single person outside of said classes gives one fig, let alone <laughs> a cheese plate, about. Yeah. Uh, the Washington Post uh, newspaper, which since 2017 or so has been uh, bravely staving off the death of democracy by creative use of marketing slogans, um, is going through a kind of uh, a, a moment. It's having it's having a week or a month. The executive editor, Sally Busby, if that's her real name, stepped down earlier this month, uh, replaced by a common Brit. Uh, former Wall Street Journal editor Matt Murray, the CEO, William Lewis, if that's his real name, uh, uh, outraged his staff last week by pointing out that the newspaper is losing $77 million a year, which is fantastic amounts of money, uh, and bleeding subscribers like a hem hemophiliac at a cutting festival. Uh, wow. Catherine, what is, uh, what is one take away that you have from this thing that not many people care about, but journalists can't stop talking about? Yeah, there was uh, the the quote that you uh, were looking for. There is he told folks in the newsroom, nobody's reading your stuff, uh, <laughs> which is a fair criticism and one that I occasionally have been known to offer to reason staffers. My Ooh. solidarity here and always is with management, as you know, yeah. and uh, it frankly seems like a kind of reasonable thing to do to say um, things are not going well at our supposedly profit generating enterprise. We should try something different. And I have no idea why everyone cares so much. Uh, Nick, you love the decline of institutional oh, yeah. media. Are you uh, having a I love the end of dance? Empire. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, Pointer.org uh, had an article where it talked about how not only did the Post lose the $77 million last year, since 2020, it has lost half of its audience. So That's when crazy. you say nobody is reading it, it is this like... You know, with Zeno's paradox, it'll never go to zero, but it's getting worse every year, right? And in big, big chunks. Um, I, you know, I think the thing I walk away from that is that nobody's reading this stuff. Okay, that explains why there's been such a drop in in audience. The last thing an American institution, an American media institution, can do to fix itself is to bring in somebody from Britain or any <laughs> other country. You know, it didn't work with Trevor Noah at the, you know, at the Daily Show. It doesn't work like an American newspaper, an American media organization needs somebody who understands wow. the country and the power. No, it's not being, I'm not being uh, native. xenophobia from I know. this. Hey, we all, I'm saying, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is about the US as a you want, you want somebody who understands <laughs> what Americans care about. And you're not going to find that in Will Lewis, who's also embroiled in, you know, the old phone hacking scandal that was part of uh, Rupert Murdoch's uh, empire over in merry old England that led to the shuttering of the most popular paper in England, the News of the World. So uh, good luck with it. It was nice knowing the Washington Post. It's now going to be battling, you know, like the Georgetown Villager for, uh, you know, used car advertisements. It's a, it's a shame. But uh, I just see you hope later. They they have some page three girls. Uh, Peter, uh, your wife works the Washington Post. You don't know anything, blah, blah, blah. There, I did it for you. What do you have to say about this? Thanks. Full disclosure, my wife works at the Washington uh, Post. Damn it! Uh, but uh, I would say, uh, actually, two quick things. One is to Nick's point about a foreigner writing an American media institution is that Will Lewis actually worked at the Wall Street Journal for a long time and um, was pretty well regarded there as a strategist and businessman and had a pretty successful tenure. So he has experience in the American news market. The other thing that I would say is that a huge amount of the focus here has been, understandably, I think, on the editorial choices that the Washington Post has made over the last several years. And... Uh, it's like I said, it's understandable that people would be would talk a lot about, oh, this was a bad headline or we didn't like how this article was framed or the reporting here or the or, or that sort of thing. That is in some ways what journalism is for, is to argue about the content. 
But the business of journalism is not just a, the business of of writing headlines and um, and deciding how to frame an article and and which sources you're going to talk to or ignore. Uh, and the business of journalism has changed a huge amount over the past just the past decade, even really over the past several years, uh, as you noted, Matt. Their uh, this is the, their audience is down fifty percent from uh, 2020, but that was a weird peak year for web journalism and uh, for washing for journalism about Washington and Trump and national politics. Um, so there's a huge boom that, that a, a lot of, uh, especially Beltway um, or politically oriented news organizations experienced. And uh, so, you know, so a big part of what is uh, what people should be paying attention to here is not just, oh, look, I think this reporter is woke or I think this story is is. Uh, you know, is reported out or framed badly, they should be ch looking at the overall business environment for news magazine, for newspapers and magazines, which has just been pretty terrible, no matter what your edit editorial choices are. In many cases, uh, we have seen the massive, massive decline of local news across the country. The Washington Post is in this place where it is both a national and a local brand. Um, we've just seen challenging times for basically every news organization, with the maybe exception of the New York Times, but even big operations like CNN are really, really struggling right now. And that's because the the technological uh, environment is changing and the demand side is changing in terms of what people who read and consume news actually want or, and are willing to to spend money on right now. And so that's that's a big challenge for, um, you know, for for an incoming publisher. And, you know, if you like if you if you are the sort of person who likes consuming news and news and uh, opinion about news and discussions of news, then you should root for the Washington Post to succeed and to be uh, to be a good paper. It is it's not subsidized. It's not right. Like um, it is. This is a you should root for businesses that employ journalists that employ a lot of them. Um, not if they're bad to, businesses and they put out stuff people don't want to read. And that's but you, know? you should root for them to be good. And that's what I'm and that's what yeah. I'm saying. You should root for them to be good and for them to find a way to uh, to actually reach audiences um and to to be successful, right? To 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 produce stuff that people want to read and want to consume. You should root for people who are good, is my view. Um I think also that journalists, uh, especially at newspapers, especially the ones who haven't left, who didn't take the buyout 20 years ago. Um, and remember how stupid buyouts are for a second here. This is what every single newspaper has done in this long period of catastrophic decline of that particular institution, is that instead of saying, I'm going to fire the bad ones so that we can have fewer staff, yeah. they're like, okay, um, I'll pay you, you know, a year's salary if you leave. Uh, and so the ones who could get a job at another paper, were like, cool, I just made a lot of money and now I'm going to a, a new paper. Um, then eventually a lot of those people spun out and are now solo on Substacks or podcast or whatever the hell they're doing. Um, and meanwhile, all the people who couldn't, uh, get a new job stayed. Uh, and those people are some of the worst entrepreneurs or some of the worst analysts of the, uh, media business you will ever see. All you have to do is look at the internal newsroom reaction to some of this that you can read in like the Vanity Fair, um, talking about the moves of the Washington Post and the concerns that they are expressing usually doesn't start with, oh, we're losing $200,000 a day. We should do something about yeah. that. They're just actually outraged that the publisher pointed that out as an active problem that they ought to think about. Um, and uh, that's, that's a bad sign. Uh, journalists should understand their own business much better than they do. And the ones who are good will um, and those are the ones who should be supported. And that is the end of the memo. Um, all right, let's go to our end of podcast, what we have been consuming in the cultural arena. Nick Gillespie, why don't you lead us off with what you have been consuming in uh, the cultural arena? Well, now you're making me, uh, you know, uh, kind of work for time. Thank you. Uh, while I remember it's, what it's I so uh, surprising. consumed. It is so surprising that yeah, at the yeah, end of the podcast. I wanted to get... I wanted to get the name of the director right, but I saw the documentary, the much ballyhooed and critically acclaimed uh, documentary Flipside, which is in select theaters around the country now by Chris Wilcha. It is, uh, he is a documentarian who had a flash uh, 30 years ago. He was going to be the next, or he was going to be the great documentarian of Generation X. And then his career kind of floundered and Flipside 
is his kind of rumination and meditation on not being able to finish a variety of product projects <laughs> over the years. He's a successful uh, commercial director. He worked with Judd Apatow, uh, who's one of the producers of this. And uh, he, a uh, part of the way he goes back to Flipside Records, which is in a small town in New Jersey where he worked uh, a used record store he worked at in high school. And it's a great kind of thoughtful, provocative, uh, very depressing and somewhat, uh, you know, solipsistic kind of look at uh, trying to finish stuff. And he brings in a bunch of other people. Anybody who's a fan of Uncle Floyd, uh, Floyd Vivino, will be uh, very happy to see him having a large role in all of this. Um, it's a it's a it's a great documentary to uh, look at. You know how do you keep things going forward when you have trouble finishing projects? How do you connect with things? How do you how do you maintain yourself where you're informed by the past but not trapped by it and things like that? I recommend uh, Flipside. It's one of the best theatrical documentaries I've seen in a long time, wow. and it also showcases. I went with a friend of mine. We saw it at the IFC Center in uh, New York City, which is like, you know, a premier showcase for this. There are about five people in the audience, uh, which is a little bit alarming. Uh, you know, theaters are going through a difficult period. Uh, it's always hard to know whether or not, you know, this is the, you know, this is a true decline or it's a momentary decline. Uh, but doc whatever you s were saying about uh, newspapers, Matt, is certainly true for Hollywood broadly, but especially for documentaries where we have more great content than ever, but the traditional ways of distributing and disseminating that content are changing radically. And, and flip side, uh, you know, it, it kind of tangentially touches on that as well. But uh, Chris Wilch's flip side, it's, uh, it's a very, very good uh, document. Peter, some movies get people in the theaters, don't they? Indeed, movies like Bad Boys Ride or Die. This is the fourth film in the Bad Boys franchise. Uh, it's Buddy Cop uh, franchise that started in 1995, starring Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. And my main complaint about this movie is that it is titled Ride or Die, and it's the fourth film. And the third film was titled Bad Boys for Life, and they could have made the fourth film bad boys for life with the number four in there. Why, why the switch up here? Okay. I know it's actually because the lyrics of the song are bad boys for life. We ride together. We die together is the thing they always say. I get it. I get it. But it's a real missed opportunity for a numerical pun title. The movie is just okay, but watching it in the context of the other films, I went back and watched the first two uh, Bad Boys movies from 1995. And you have uh, way too much time on your hands. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I mean, these are not even, this is like a third of the movies I've watched in the last week. Um, so I went back and watched the, the old ones cause I'm uh, actually a pretty big Michael Bay fan and Michael Bay directed the first two movies. The first oh. one was actually his debut and you see so many of the Michael Bay hallmarks that would be sort of become part of his over, over the years. It's set in Miami where he lives. The movie is so, the, the first one is so beautifully orange. I can't even describe how much orange there is in this movie. Like, it's just like every frame is like there's black shadows and then there's orange, like deep orange Miami sky. And it's just a great showcase for the for a, a kind of beauty that Miami has. Uh, but also go back and watch those early Bad Boys films. They are so ridiculously hilariously vulgar and like not okay in today's terms because the because the the, the bad boys dynamic was uh, was it was homophobic it was sexist it was just totally obsessed with uh you know with like uh, skimpy uh, scantily clad women their sex scenes right it's just like it's gross and it's profane and this was just sort of the assumption that like this is what a couple of dudes uh, who were like pretty cool and kind of obnoxious but like this is what bad boys we're like, and you now watch the the, the two most recent films. Uh, the, the 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 previous one came out in 2020, and this one in 2024. Different set of directors. These guys are older. Uh, Martin Lawrence and and um, Will Smith have you know they're in their 50s or something now, right? Uh, they're middle aged men, and the movies have they're still kind of vulgar. Right? There's still a bunch of cussing and some violence, but there is this kind of 
reflection in them, um, and and really, a, I, I think a change that is at least partially attributable to the culture, where like they the movie seemed kind of ashamed of their earlier sort of displays of vulgar masculinity, uh, and there is a sense in which the movies are. are not retconning. Um, what's the word? They they're looking back at those at those earlier films and those earlier displays of um, of braggadocio, right? And and saying maybe maybe that was actually kind of bad. Um, and it's really interesting uh, to watch these films in order all together and to see them now as kind of uh, track as tracking shifts in uh like uh in cultural understandings of masculinity so i don't i didn't love the new one i i actually really like the first two um uh, but it's okay uh, will smith still very charming martin lawrence still very funny uh but watch them all together do a do a marathon of four bad boys movies um leading up to bad yep. boys ride or die which sadly is not for life um, and, uh, and, and just think about how, like the changes that you see in our culture over 30 years and the ways that, uh, sort of cool testosterone inflected masculinity are portrayed on screen by big stars. Is Catherine? there a joke about the, uh, Academy about the slap. slap. Oh, absolutely. There is a moment in the third act in which Will Smith is having a panic attack. His character is having a panic attack. And um, Martin Lawrence uh, snaps him out of it by just slapping the ever living shit out of him. Language. Uh, Catherine, I know you agree with me that orange has two syllables. What did you consume? Uh, speaking of a uh, reflection on 30 years of testosterone-fueled masculinity, I went to Pride. Uh, so I went to... <laughs> I Catherine, to... that is my favorite transition ever. <laughs> I went to DC's Pride Parade. I took my children because I think it's important to have children be exposed to drag queens and people who have covered their nipples with electrical tape. And uh, and as a the kind of libertarian that makes some libertarians cry, I uh, just wanted to be sure that I contributed to my kids' education in that way. But more specifically, and on a reason relevant note, over and above the fact that um, Pride really is a cool celebration of how far we've come in recognizing just the straight up rights and also cultural acceptance of gay people, um, I saw Wendy the Water Drop. And you may remember Reason's past coverage of Wendy, the water drop. Wendy is the is the mascot of DC water. She was very, very expensive <laughs> to create. Uh, hmm. And we, Wait, uh, we Wendy is not a like one of those water D and D characters. Wendy, the water just... drop is literally just a giant felt drop of water. Uh, she was at the parade handing out uh, water bottles uh, and other swag to the parade goers. I am sure that the taxpayers of DC uh, paid wow. for her appearance there. And uh, I got to see her up close, and she looks like garbage. It looks like a child's <laughs> art project. It's paper mache and some felt. I think her nose was loose. So I just want to say congratulations to the gays and uh, anti-congratulations to DC Water for their garbage mascot that we helped pay for. Did the uh, Pride Parade get disrupted by uh, pro-Palestinian groups? Because Philadelphia's Pride Parade had a great standoff between pro-Palestinian guys that like muscle bears. So there was, yeah, there was actually a simultaneous, uh, in another location, there was a simultaneous protest that had to do um, with uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, they did not, as far as I know, overlap much in D.C. There was a point where someone was biking by, uh, shouting from the river to the sea, uh, and uh, they, there was a, they got booed by some yeah. gays. So um, I don't know what exactly was going on there, but there, as far as I know, it was no active I hope conflict. They were Maybe the gays their... were just booing the bike. There's just like anti-bike in D.C. Gays are pro-bike in D.C., yeah. um, but... Uh, D.C. bike riders are pretty Hamas annoying. anti-gays, so... The, uh, obviously, we're already in it, but uh, I love in uh, during Pride Month when Raytheon and, uh, you know, the CIA and the NSA start doing all their Pride yeah, so there was, like you know, that. the D.C. Pride Parade is basically corporate pride and yeah. then like various government entities. And uh, I would say at this point it's fully tipped and people are far more excited for like the Hilton float <laughs> than for the, you know, yeah. the various or, government players. Um, big Conrad. representative from the Methodists. 
I don't know what that's about. A lot of Methodists there. Huh. Anyway. Gaithedists. Gaithedists. Um, uh, nope. I... John Wesley Hardon, right? Could be their <laughs> spokesman now. <laughs> what? Never I, yeah, it all makes sense. Uh, so I consumed uh, a columnist who I've mentioned once before, but it's been a couple of years, I think, uh, but came across my Twitter feed for the first time in a long time this morning, and I was so delighted uh, by his piece, part of his ongoing never ending uh column called the number ones over at stereo gum a guy named tom brahan who has a book also called the number ones which i have not read but uh, it's a weekly column and it's about uh just tracking from the beginning of 1958 to now we're up to 2014 every song that reached number one in the pop charts and it is just such a uh, a, a very delightful, music-loving, even if he doesn't particularly love the song, uh, as was the case today. The song was uh, Shake It Off by Taylor Swift, uh, which was number one for four weeks mm -hmm. in 2014. Um, but you learn so much, and it's not like, hey, you're going to learn here. It's just a very breezy column uh, in which you will get all kinds of pop history, and you'll see where this fits into Taylor uh, Swift's career. In this case, the, the, the riddle answered is this is how she... Uh, decisively turned away from country and into pop and a bunch of other things besides. But it's just delightful, and there's a bunch of other music that you'll be exposed to along the way. Um, and uh, I love the stick to of someone who's just going to keep writing that weekly column every every time and uh, and still doing it great. Um, and it's much longer than a normal column. It's a good, solid uh, read and listen if you uh, click on the links. Just great. Tom Brahan, I want to shout him out. So the number ones, and we'll put a link in the show notes as we usually do. All right, that's all the What's linkage. your uh, favorite number one? What's your favorite number one, Matt? You can't leave us hanging. I don't know, man. It changes every every single day, Nick. Um, I, it's like, I, right. I, can't, I can't say, you know? Uh, uh, maybe it's, no, it didn't, it didn't get to number one. I was thinking I, of a song I just discovered, uh, recently, which is by, uh, Jesse Coulter, uh, I'm not Lisa from 1976, reached number four. Um, just a heartbreaking, ah. sweet country song, uh, by, uh, outlaw country, uh, uh, stalwart and Waylon Jennings is a wife. Um, so I, I just did a, a double. I just pulled a Peter. Uh, all right. That's all the Peter pulling we have time for mm. on this uh, edition of The Reason. <laughs> Who I guess people. left because a new Bad Boys movie came out or? Uh... <laughs> what you going to do? Uh, so uh, go to all of our <laughs> podcasts at reason.com slash podcasts. Um, Nick, I was wondering if there are any events that are happening, particularly they're not only in the uh, New York City area, that you would like to advertise at the end of our podcast here. Uh, certainly there is one on Tuesday, uh, June 11th with in New York with Corey D'Angelo. Go to reason.com slash events uh, to attend that. Uh, seats still available, but barely uh, talking about his book, The Parent Revolution. And then also Reason is going to have a, a big contingent at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas in the middle of July. Use the code REASON50 and you'll get 50 bucks off your admission. Uh, you'll also be able to find information about that uh, in various tweets and onlines and things like that. But go to uh, Freedom Fest and check out uh, Reason's uh, team there. I'll be there. Jacob Sullen will be there. Robbie Suave will be there. We're going to have a whole day of special Reason events. And it's got headliners like Javier Malay uh, and Ice-T. Speaking of never body count, never had a number one, but Cop Killer is still, uh, you know, it's still in the charts for many of us. Uh, and uh, Rob Schneider is going to be there as well. If we can He's get Ice-T to say hello. off Weta, I'm, I'm, that's it. That's, I uh, think we're going to be able to get a lot of things to happen there. So Steve uh, Pinker, it's good. Uh, Steve Bannon, hopefully. No, he's not going to yeah. be there. Uh, he'll be, uh, well, maybe he'll be dialing in from uh, Leavenworth or something like that. Uh, that would be good. Uh, all right. Uh, we will catch you next week. Be safe out there. Uh, two syllables in orange. Thank you.